Welcome to uh, the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute's uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Today we are very happy to have Charles Van Loon here from Cornell University. And uh, I, I learned a little bit about Charlie just by reading some of his, uh, he has a short bio on his website. And there's a Utah connection in there which I wanted to uh, mention. But uh, he, uh, he knew that he wanted to be a teacher ever since seventh grade. <laughs> when his uh, geography instructor allowed to teach class for 15 minutes. And uh, from then, it was no stopping him uh, to becoming a professor. Uh, he, uh, he studied in University of Michigan, started out as a meteorology and uh, a naval architecture, and then switched to, uh, to meteorology and oceanography. And figured out, though, by the end of his sophomore year that he clearly loved mathematics and then moved on to applied mathematics. And uh, he did his PhD under the direction of Cleve Moeller. Uh, Cleve Moeller is the person who started uh, uh, MATLAB, and and, uh, and I don't know if you know that Cleve grew up in Salt Lake City. Yeah. So he, he went to graduated from East High School, uh, and when he was when Cleve was back for his 50th year high school reunion, he came and gave a distinguished lecture too. <laughs> so uh, he has. Uh, Charlie has been incredibly productive for his PhD. He did work on the, on the generalized singular value decomposition and has become you know, one of the world leaders in uh, numerical linear algebra. I think many of us know him from this book, uh, Matrix Computations, that he co-authored with Gene Golub. I have the second edition. There's now at least a fourth edition. I believe will be. Will be. And uh, there are, he's also authored five other textbooks. I went online last night just to see um, how many citations this book has had, so you guys could compare with your papers and books. <laughs> so this this book has been cited 29,930 times. As of yesterday, it's probably over 30,000 today. <laughs> so I think that that's that that says it's a classic. So let me uh, now uh, join me in welcoming Charlie Van Loon from Cornell. Thanks, Chris. It's really great to be here. I mean, it's just, uh, I've had a terrific morning, and I'm sure the rest of the day will be wonderful, too. So uh, I'd also like to thank Chris not for mentioning a little bit about the naval architecture thing. So that when I was in high school, that's what I wanted to do. But on my application at the University of Michigan, I spelled naval wrong, as in belly button. So <laughs> when I went to uh, meet with my advisor, he said, oh, you're interested in the design and analysis of belly buttons. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, thanks. OK. so. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk about the stuff I'm working on right now, and uh, what I see as a sort of sequel to uh, earlier work. Um, you know, block matrix computations are very important. And the high-level question today, what I hope to communicate, is uh, they're bound to become more important in the tensor business. Okay, so I just want to make things reasonably self-contained. So by a tensor, I simply mean a higher-dimensional matrix. So, you know, a matrix is a second-order tensor. Uh, now, instead of AIJ, I have AIJKL. And um, uh, these data objects get big quick, uh, and they are occurring with increasing uh, uh, frequency. Um, so again, uh, we played around with zero first order and second order tensors all our lives. You can think of a Rubik's cube as a three by three by three tensor. Okay, so where might they come from? Uh, and uh, all over the place, but let's just think along these lines. I mean, maybe you have a, f a, f a function of four variables. Maybe it's the output of some simulation on the grid, and you have samplings of f at each grid point. Well, I could assemble those values into a fourth order tensor. Or maybe the uh, IJKL entry uh, captures some interaction between four variables or factors. And you've done a ton of experiments and are interested in the connections of those um, variables. Nowadays, people are interested in high dimensional models. We feel liberated because we have so much memory and compute power that we'd like to really uh, kick up the sophistication of our modeling. Uh, and the tensors are a natural consequence of, of that. And uh, just to go over th things to make you feel comfortable, of course, a picture has a red, green, and, and blue matrix. I could stack them one on top of another 
and uh, you have a third order tensor. Of course, it's very short in one of those dimensions, but nevertheless, it is that. Uh, anytime you go to a, a stadium and are told to go to a certain section, row, and seat, you are doing a tensor computation, right? <laughs> a, a triplet of integers is naming a, a location. Um, a block <coughs> matrix is secretly a tensor. Now, a lot, and, and what's sort of interesting about the tensor area, you know, sometimes you look at an object and say, hey, it's a matrix. Another time you look at the same thing and say, hey, it's a tensor. But a block matrix is, uh, in its own way, a fourth order tensor. Um, yes, um, there is the uh, four or five entry of the matrix, but it's also the uh, two one entry of the two three block. So I could name that number, that entry, with a, uh, a four-tuple of integers, okay? So, um, there is, you know, so there's a matrix, but I could also build it into a fourth-order tensor. So again, you've been there before if you've played around or thought about block uh, matrices. Now, what about a block tensor? What do I mean by that? Okay, well, suppose we have a third-order tensor. 9 by 5 by 8. Now, just as in the matrix case, when you block a matrix, you visit the rows and you group them. You visit the columns and you group them. And there's your blocking. I do exactly the same thing, only now I'll have more than just two dimensions. So uh, there is a choice that I'm making, and, and, it, and it is a choice. There are different ways of blocking the matrix, different ways of blocking a tensor. And lo and behold, if I choose that, I am uh, choosing to regard that tensor as a 3 by 2 by 4 block tensor. Okay? Uh, and the 2, 1, 3 block, uh, using the MATLAB colon notation, would consist of those uh, numbers. Okay? So we can block a tensor. Now, before I get going, let me just sort of say that uh, most of what I say is in two uh, recent papers with my current graduate student, uh, Stefan Ragnarsson, uh, and it's based on or supported by NSF. And here is the perspective I'd like to give to my talk. Uh, and you can put these kinds of slides up if you're old and have been around, okay? So in my lifetime, I've seen this kind of sequence of events. You know, when I was a graduate student, it was this matrix factorizations, that was the paradigm. Uh, very much um, algorithms were presented at the IJ level. Uh, and, and so we'll think of that as scalar level thinking. And then computers got more sophisticated and we realized that, that memory traffic is perhaps more important than flops. And we got into blocking algorithms so that we could better utilize things like cache. And this is all summed up in the LAPAC project. It was preceded by LINPAC, which is very much the top square. LAPAC acknowledged that blocks, block algorithms are of interest and uh, we went through that period. Um, now, um, uh, I would sort of say at this point, we're transitioning to um, a, a higher level here. It's not on my slide. No. Um, uh, where um, we're moving to tensors, OK? And so I see this as the next chapter in this kind of logical um, progression. Again, I, uh, I, uh, I like to precede talks with, with as much perspective as possible. Um, let's talk about big, because everybody nowadays is working on algorithms that scale. And in matrix computations, big means you have a big matrix. The number of rows times the number of columns is big. Now, in tensor computations, those stats are important, OK? But probably more important is the dimension. For example, if I have a 100 order or 1,000 ordered tensor, that's two in each direction, no computer in the world can store that thing, okay? So this is big not by, for reasons of n, but for reasons of d. And when you hear people talk about the curse of dimensionality, they're sort of talking about this. I mentioned a few minutes ago that we're all, not pressured, but hungry for more sophisticated models the ones that involve higher dimensions. 
uh, and uh, that's a depressure, okay? And uh, that's where we really need to focus, or we should in part focus our attention on algorithms that scale with D. And uh, I would sort of say right now, uh, from one's point of view, like the matrix, you know, my point of view, which is matrix oriented, that you know, we're, in a, we're in a period of matrix-based scientific computation, right? Uh, you look at numerical PDEs, numerical optimization, you know, at the innermost loop is probably some linear algebra operation, uh, and uh, thus I would sort of say that we're used to thinking of make, you know, scientific computing ultimately in a matrix sort of formulation. Again, I, I would say we're transitioning to something a little more complicated there with tensors. Okay, now, sliding into the topic of my talk. So matrices come equipped with all these different kinds of properties and things, and uh, for every one of those, there is some tensor analog, um, sometimes more than one analog. Sometimes it's ambiguous, okay? And uh, I'll probably touch on just about every one of these uh, in my uh, talk. Okay. I want to stress the bottom one here, data sparse. Um, again, uh, we're all used to sparse matrices, ones that have a lot of zeros in them, and you, you can cut some corners when that's your matrix. Uh, and and uh, what do I mean by data sparse? Uh, same idea. Basically, I can describe the matrix with many fewer than n squared numbers. This is tied up with the idea of rank. You hear someone say, hey, we have a low rank approximation. You're driven by the attractiveness of data sparsity. It enables you to solve big problems if you're clever enough. Okay. So the particular emphasis there on the bottom thing. Okay, now, if, if we're transitioning, say, from matrix computations to tensor computations, you need things to, so to speak, bridge the gap. And I want to identify two things here. Um, one is the idea of unfolding. I can take a tensor, like a Rubik's cube, slice it, and obtain a three by nine matrix. I would say that I unfolded the tensor, and it now is a matrix. Now the advantage of doing that is that now I can do a matrix computation on that unfolded tensor. And hopefully that matrix computation tells me something about the parent tensor. Okay. So that will be a theme. But the key thing here is, and this is the, the predominant paradigm in tensor computation nowadays, which is unfold it in some intelligent way, do a calculation, and then talk about the tensor as a result of what you discover. The second thing is a, an operation, and that's the Kronecker product. And you'll see this a lot in my t slides, and I'll review it when I get to the point. Uh, it's an operation that's a matrix operation, but you find it occurring a lot in tensor computations because of the unfolding business. Okay, well, I guess I just sort of talked my way through this. Again, but it's worth stating again because it's so important. This is the paradigm, right? Reshape a tensor, uh, do a matrix computation, discover things, and then draw conclusions uh, about the tensor. Okay, unfolding. Okay, so um, let's look at some unfolding. So you can see there are many options uh, and uh, um, whatever. So this is the, the sort of slice thing. Again, think of a Rubik's Cube. I can slice it three different ways. Okay, uh, and each way would give rise to a different three by nine matrix. Okay, again, this is the colon notation. Okay, these are different what are called slices. And uh, I assemble them and there's an unfolding. Here's another example. I gotta pick small ones because you run out of space real quick. But here's a fifth order tensor. I've made the third, fourth, and fifth modes particularly short. So what am I doing here? I'm actually stacking matrices, okay? This is slang for the two, one, two matrix. The colon notation here means go the full route in that mode. And each one of those is a matrix. Okay? Um, the third, fourth, and fifth modes are being used to name the, uh, the slice in question. So there I am stacking all those. Um, a particularly important family of unfoldings are called the modal unfoldings. 
Um, my example is a four by three by two tensor. And uh, there is a pattern here. This is a mode one unfolding. If you visit a column, what do you notice? You notice that the second and third indices are frozen, and I vary the first. Those columns are called fibers. That's the 2-2 two -two fiber. Okay? So um, we have some terms here for these kinds of unfoldings. Now, these will tend to be very long horizontal matrices okay, for typical uh, dimensions. Um, but they're called modal unfoldings. And uh, here's the same tensor uh, with the other th uh, two modal unfoldings. Okay. Um, a note here, um, I chose to uh, sequence the fibers in a very systematic way. If you look at the subscripts across there, that's kind of a, 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 what I call a VEC ordering. If you think of these as entries in a matrix, I'm going down column one, column two, uh, you know, all, I do all the ones, and I do all the twos, and so on. So that's kind of a canonical way to arrange the modes, okay? But you do have different choices. Tarvin. Yep, yep. So a, a question. So now when you go between orders of tensors, uh, so between a second order tensor and a first order tensor, you have your, speaking in, in array uh, language, we would say uh, column major, no major order. Mm -hmm. You go from a third to a second, mm -hmm. the ambiguity increases. Do you require that you decrease in your adapting? When, when you do that decrease, that you decrease only between, uh, you have transitions only between two orders, and that you create, say, from a fourth order, you have to go from a fourth order to the third order, and a third order to a second order. You, okay, so and, and, and you view them as compositions of those. Yeah, you, you can. Uh, but then the ambiguity grows because at each step. That's right. Know, these are sort of canonical orderings, and, and if you look at how arrays are typically stored, it would be in this kind of generalized column major order. And, and as you visit the indices from left to right, uh, they vary less in frequency. Uh, so um, that, that, is, that is a choice. One of the themes that will come up in a few minutes is uh, 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 block unfoldings, where we're going to depart from that, uh, this idea in a second. But um, there is, again, a lot of choice, and, and uh, uh, proximity is, is very important. For example, uh, you want, if two numbers are adjacent in the tensor, you'd like them to be sort of nearby in the unfolding, and that might not be the case with some of these orderings. <coughs> okay. Um, incidentally, <laughs> people hate the tensor area because there are too many subscripts. I mean, this is, this is the, uh, so here's a nice slide to drive home that point. But uh, no, as I'll say later, notation is very important, and we've got to clean up our act in tensor computation so that it's not so daunting. You, you, you do have vectors of subscripts. It's very hard to communicate algorithms and things because of all these possibilities. But just one, I think from my last slide here on, on unfolding, so here's sort of a two-dimensional unfolding of a fifth-order tensor. Um, I'm using the first three indices in the tensor to name the row. So these are names of rows. I, I happen to be using triplets of integers to name rows. Um, and the columns are uh, defined by this, uh, the fourth and fifth modes. Okay, so again, many ways to unfold the tensor. Okay? All right, so uh, let's talk about a fourth order uh, example and stress this point about proximity. Why? Because if a computer goes to memory and grabs a chunk of a matrix, you like those that chunk to be contiguous. And maybe you have one style of storing a matrix as a tensor, you flatten it, you would hope there'd be some kind of proximity there in the flattened tensor so that you could have a nice block algorithm. Now let's just see why uh, some choices are better than others. Again, assuming that the traditional column major order storage of the tensor. So if you do the first one there, um, again, those are matrices. I'm taking the fourth order tensor and making it into a block matrix. Okay? In the first instance, that one one block, that data is not contiguous in the tensor. Okay? But the one one block here is. So in analyzing, is this a better unfolding than that? There may be different criteria. But one of them should be this thing about proximity, because if we want to do high-performance computing on the unfolded tensor, let's make it set up in an, get it set up in an attractive way. 
So this is uh, one of the things that Stefan and I worked on, which is what we call block tensor unfoldings. So for example, and I guess we're talking about a third order tensor here, um, if you do like a modal un unfolding, um, uh, you would find that um, um, data in the tensor, the block tensor, so I block up the tensor, uh, and here is where one block might go in, in, the, in the flattened uh, arrangement. So it's pretty <coughs> contiguous, but not totally contiguous. Yeah? If we're thinking about the computational sort of aspects of these unfoldings, then really shouldn't we be thinking about the 1D unfolding, which is how it would be stored? I mean, it would be stored as a 1D array. Oh, no, I can, like, let's, let's talk matrix. I can store a matrix by block. So um, uh, um, uh, I could store, suppose, suppose I have a, 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 a 10 by 10 block matrix with 5 by 5 entries. That one one block is a 5 by 5 matrix. Now I could store those 25 numbers contiguously, all right? Or if I, uh, that, it won't be the case that they're contiguous if I store that matrix in column major order. So, I mean, I agree. In the end, everything is linearly mapped out. And isn't that the continuity we're interested in, that one continuity? Yeah, but what I'm saying here is uh, a block of the, that, that the 311 block of the tensor in my example, when I flatten it in the, in the traditional way, uh, that data is not contiguous. That, that's, that's, that's the point of the slide. I just picked three blocks and showed what happened to them in the flattening. Okay, so, um, uh, so uh, when we do the uh, block unfolding, we take steps to uh, make, make it contiguous. So for example, the 1-1, one, one, well, the 3 one, one block, which up here is like this, we uh, take that block and lay it out continuously in the unfolding, and it becomes the 3 one block. So it happens it becomes the 3 one block in the matrix. Mm -hmm. So it's not a profound thing, but it, you simply can uh, uh, Flatten the tensor to respect continuity, con con contiguity in the tensor. And uh, here's something that's missing in the tensor literature at this point, to my knowledge, which are uh, what I would call block tensor data structures. Now, in the matrix case, if you look in the literature, people have clever ways of laying out the data to achieve uh, high performance from a, from a block algorithm. There's literature on that. There is no literature, to my knowledge, uh, about uh, smart data structures for tensors, smart block data structures for tensors. So I'm just sort of saying this is an arena that deserves some work. Okay, so enough about unfolding. As I said, that's sort of step one in the paradigm. Then you do some computation on the unfolding. And let's take a look at that. And I have two um, uh, main examples here to uh, highlight. One's been around for 10 years or so. This is much more recent and builds off of some work I did uh, earlier in the 90s. Okay, so I, I did mention that the Kronecker product is a, an operation that frequently occurs, uh, and you'll see a lot of it, so let me just um, make sure everybody's on board with what it is. Uh, it's a way of combining two matrices to produce a third, much larger matrix. The much larger matrix is a block matrix, and the blocks are determined by, the, by C, and, the, and every block is a multiple of C, and the multiple comes from B. Okay? So there you go. Um, you can string them together, okay? um, and you very rapidly get big matrices. Again, if I had a thousand of these things strung together, uh, it would be two to the 1,000 in size. These are data sparse matrices. What do I mean by that? Again, this happens to be a, a 24 by 24 matrix, and thus, as a matrix of that size, there are 576 slots. However, only 29 numbers uh, define that matrix. Okay, so that uh, is a data sparse um, matrix. And we talk about, uh, say, approximating a large matrix with a Kronecker product. You are engaged in this hey, let's find a data sparse approximation of my matrix. Um, you'll hear about rank one tensors. Well, a rank one matrix is UV transpose, okay, where U and V are vectors. The times table, our familiar nine by nine uh, matrix is a rank one uh, matrix. 
Now, if you have three vectors, I can do exactly the same kind of thing. The ijk entry will simply be a product of ui, vj, and wk. Okay, so a very simple uh, <coughs> generalization of rank one. Uh, and there's a connection with Kronecker products. Uh, if I build a tensor uh, uh, in this style, u uh, uh, tensor v tensor w, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a three-dimensional ten tensor, third-order tensor. If I took that and strung it out as a vector using the vec operation, the column major order idea, you would discover that that is simply the Kronecker product of the three vectors in that order. Hey, what about rank? Well, the rank of a matrix is the shortest sum that renders the matrix, right? So if you're a rank three matrix, I can write you as a sum of three rank one matrices and nothing shorter. You show up at my door with a tensor and ask this question, what is the shortest sum like that, okay? Uh, and if the answer is R, then um, you would conclude that A is a, a rank R tensor. Now, it turns out in the tensor business, there are many different kinds of rank. This is what's called the outer product rank. You'll see another definition shortly. But this is a very, very hard problem, okay? And, and that minimum R might not exist, or there might be uh, funny <coughs> business uh, associated with it. Let me actually back up and say something. So for example, let's take the smallest possible tensor, two by two by two, okay? And according to this definition, if I generate that tensor randomly, you'd find that 79% of the time, the answer is two, and 21% of the time, the answer is three. And this is indistinct, this is this very distinct from the matrix setting. With probability one, a two by two matrix has rank two. Take any matrix, n by n, with probability one, it's rank one. So, sorry, <laughs> rank n. The set of rank deficient matrices is, has zero measure. Yeah? Are you putting zero or ones in the co coordinates or real numbers? These, I, I, MATLAB, rand n, two comma two comma two. Each entry is a randomly distributed um, uh, uh, entry and, and is it, is it random between zero and more binary, or is it a real number? It's a normally distributed. I, I pick, oh, uh, yeah, normal. normal. Okay. Yeah. So you'd get those percents I mentioned would be different with different distributions. But the point is this. Um, uh, some of the time, it's rank three, and a non-trivial other part of the time, it's rank two. Okay? That's a hint at the complexity of the rank issue with tensors. And, it's, and already, I'm, and I'm, and I'm at the smallest possible tensor. And here we see something non-standard. You know, in matrix computations, we're fond of saying, oh, yeah, you're, you're close to uh, uh, this particular rank deficient matrix. Well, how do I talk like that in this venue? Right? You're a two by two by two tensor. Maybe you're rank three. How do I say, or should I say, that you're close to a rank two tensor? And is rank two rank deficient? The whole business about rank is engaging lots of people from very abstract uh, multilinear algebra, the practical people and so on, but the fact is it's a deep and tricky issue. And that should make us nervous or excited actually that there's a lot to do here if we are to um, push the matrix computation ideas into the tensor realm. Okay, having said that, let me now uh, this, uh, briefly talk about some decompositions here. This one is about 10 years old, and it's called the higher order SVD. And um, I want to remind you of these modal unflattenings. Here's the idea. Um, for each modal unflattening, I can do an SVD. Okay? Um, and uh, so if it's third order, there will be these three uh, SVDs. I take all the U matrices, okay? and um, they uh, actually define what's called a core tensor. So maybe I should have had D equal three. Well, I, actually, I do down here. But up there, I, I'm taking the, the three U matrices and uh, writing an, an expansion here. I'm, I'm choosing to describe the, uh, the ith component of A in, uh, in terms of these U matrices and what's called a core tensor. And um, what's the core tensor? Again, if A was 3 by 3 by 3, the core tensor is 3 by 3 by 3, but special. 
And what I'm doing is writing that original Rubik's Cube in terms of uh, rank one tensors and uh, that core tensor. The linear combo is coming from that core tensor. Here it is down here, okay? So these are columns from the U matrix. That is a rank one tensor. Um, there's a rank, uh, sorry, an, an order three tensor. And I'm writing A as this linear combo. Now if this was the SVD, if D was two, uh, despite the funny notation, this actually would be the SVD. And that would be a matrix. And that would be a diagonal matrix. In this setting, S is not diagonal. You might think, why wouldn't it be great if that three by three Rubik's cube had, you know, sort of the diagonal uh, uh, of where the non-zeros are and everything else zero? No. However, that S tensor has structure. It is generally graded as you walk from the one 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 entry to the n n n entry. Things get small. I can actually take slices and tell you about their size, and, and you would also see a, a, a diminution. But there is no, strictly speaking, a, a pretty diagonal higher order SVD. However, this has found lots of applications. You can truncate that thing instead of going the full distance to N1, N2, and N3. You can lop it off, and you get some kind of lower rank approximation. But you don't have the kinds of theorems you do in the matrix case. You know, using the SVD, you give me a matrix, I can give you the closest rank seven matrix to it, okay? And talk very precisely using SVD. Um, if I lock this off and maybe have seven terms here, I'm not gonna be able to tell you that it is the closest rank seven tensor, okay? However, again, this has found lots of applications. The whole point here is to discover patterns that are implicit in the tensor A. Yes? Another important property of SVD is the, non, uh, is the relationship between rank and non-zero single value. Yep. Is there any? No, no, no. <laughs> so, so, so I would say it's, it's at once discouraging, but it's at once exciting because it means we have to go look for alternatives. Okay. And you find that the structure of S for tensor then is the relationship between the structure of S and the unfoldings that you mentioned earlier. Well, it comes from those unfoldings. For example, um, there, like in my example, there were three SVDs. So, so we have three sets of singular values, and they're, they're each one individually decreasing. If I took certain slices of S and told you, and, and you asked me how big is that slice, I would give you the answer would, would involve those singular values. So very much, uh, um, in, the, in talking about the gradation in S, you would talk about the singular values that showed up in those modal unfoldings. And of course, these, U, these, U, these, these are singular vectors from those unfoldings. If I, if I run this again on S, do I get the kind of expected results? Uh, uh, okay, so um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, no, you would, it would, uh, S has what's called an all orthogonality property. Right. And if you did the unfoldings, you'd sort of get a bunch of identity matrices showing up. Which is kind of what you, I think, would expect. Yeah. Right? It would be there because you'd like to see S times identity. Right, uh, exactly. Okay, just, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of said, talked about this. And this is the, the, uh, the truncated uh, HOSVD. Um, I mentioned that in the tensor business, there are different kinds of rank. Well, let me pause and mention one of them. Um, if, in fact, A can be written this way, where these are much less or, or just less than the dimensions, N1, 2, and 3, then you would say that A has a multilinear rank R1 comma R2 comma R3. In other words, now we're going to talk about rank as a vector of integers. And the entries in that vector are the ranks of the unfoldings. Okay? So that's another very common um, approach to the rank issue in, in um, the business. Well, since Orly is here, and she's the inventor of a great generalization of this, but this ongoing research, let me just pause and say something before I get on to my next tensor decomposition. So there's a, a, a generalized singular value decomposition, which actually was in my thesis back in the 70s, and uh, that basically dealt with this. So you give me two matrices, I'll diagonalize them both. So let's look at the first two rows up there. Um, my thesis was about that. It turns out that U1 and U2 are orthogonal. 
a V is not orthogonal, so it's not quite a, to have the beauty of the ordinary SVB. But in many settings where you have two matrices and you want to take them apart and do things, the generalized SVB uh, found quite a few applications. But now there's a much bigger challenge. Instead of being given just two data matrices, I'm given N, and I'm asked to discover patterns in them or to see if there's some connections. So what you want to do is, uh, in the traditional uh, <coughs> decomposition paradigm, find some decomposition that takes your given matri matrices into, and turns them into some kind of canonical form. And uh, this is the form that the generalized uh, SVB takes. Uh, and, and you visit, um, well, each, there's a common V matrix. Um, the sigmas are all diagonal, and the U's are going to be just non-singular. The value of this, the strength of this, depends on how you choose V. There are many different options, okay? And right now our uh, research agenda includes uh, uh, justifying or finding intelligent ways of developing that V matrix so that it really exposes uh, the hidden structure that you're looking for. But anyway, uh, you know, when you graduate from two to three matrices, you run out of gas in matrix computations, right? Because you can only hit a matrix on the, either on the left or the right. And if you give me two matrices, I can do a lot. But if you give me three, I'm stuck. Just like if you look at like the quadratic eigenvalue problem, where you have the AX plus lambda BX plus lambda squared CX, three matrices. Uh, the methods for those things can't appro be approached by, hey, let's simultaneously diagonalize A, B, and C. You just can't do it. So that's what the challenge here, and we see it now coming up in, in this sense. And uh, again, the idea is to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, address and, and discover things in multiple data sets. Okay, so the A matrices, you can think of them as slices in a tensor, but we're actually working with more general situations here where the A's might have different numbers of rows. But in any case, you can sort of see a nice interplay here between the tensor business and uh, hard matrix computations. Okay, I want to talk about a, 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 a decomposition you might not be aware of. Um, I'll start at the matrix level. And this is called the Kronecker product SVD. Uh, you give me a block matrix where the blocks are all of the same size. Okay. And what I'm going to do is write that matrix as a sum of Kronecker products. Okay. And um, the actual way, these are, this is a very computable thing. It's one of my uh, most favorite SVD al uh, applications. You end up sort of reshaping A into a, a, a different kind of matrix. Take its SVD, and then you take the singular vectors out of that, and reshape them into U, and take other singular vectors. They get reshaped into V, and you get this expansion. It inherits all the great properties of the SVD. I lop this off after two, and that is the closest uh, sum of two of two Kronecker products to A, as measured in the Frobenius norm. So this is a way of approximating a block matrix. Uh, it's found lots of applications. Uh, my favorite one is sort of from signal processing, where A is actually block toplets, uh, and in principle should be the exact Kronecker product of two toplets matrices. But noise wrecks that, and you then do this, and uh, the U and the V that come out of that, the first, the first term are actually topless. And this also has been used for preconditioners. Um, and these are, again, uh, especially if you lock this off early, data sparse approximations of a block matrix. OK, um, I guess I have a tendency to talk into the next slide. but. Um, here, here is uh, exactly what I said before. Um, now, uh, remember an early slide uh, designed to make you comfortable with the tensor business. A block matrix is a fourth order tensor. Okay. And uh, we have then in the, uh, with this Kronecker product SVD, a mechanism for approximating a fourth order tensor. Okay. Now, um, uh, and again, here's a reminder that if I take the Kronecker product of two matrices, I'm writing this sort of in tensor language, I get a, a fourth order tensor out of it. So here is a framework for a higher order KSVD. And I'll talk right now about the fourth order case and say a few things about more general things in a second. So you take your block tensor, 
and you do a block unfolding. Right? That's from like 15 minutes ago. And then I compute the KSVD of that. Now that is equivalent, and so much of this is just reshaping. Um, that matrix expansion is equivalent to this tensor expansion, where this I put in quotes because I didn't want to introduce yet another special symbol. Uh, this is the tensor product of two, um, ten uh, sorry, a Kronecker product between two tensors. And it's, it does exactly what you think it is. For example, um, uh, and here you see the use of multi-index notation. Uh, when I talk about the uh, uh, Kronecker product between two tensors, I get a, uh, a block tensor. Each block is a multiple of V, and the multiple comes from U. It's just like the Kronecker products of, of matrices. So this is a way, if you reshape it and think along these lines, a way of approximating a fourth order tensor. And it's distinctly different from the higher order SVD framework. Okay. So this is a mechanism, uh, a different kind of mechanism for developing a low rank data sparse approximation of a fourth order tensor. And I'd like to push this a little bit further and weave into my discussion here a, a note about special structure. Okay, I should have said something at the start. But so much in matrix computations, right, is specializing our familiar algorithms when the matrix has some exploitable structure. I mean, there's so much of that going on. And that's going on in the tensor business. And let me mention a very common type of structure that you see in fourth order tensors as might emerge from electronic structure applications. A fourth order tensor with these properties, hey, flip the first two indices, no change. Flip the third and fourth, no change. Rigidly swap them, no change. So here is a tensor with three types of symmetry. Three types of symmetry. And uh, what if we turned loose this higher order KSVD technology on that? Uh, would we get a special structure out of that? You'd want that to be the case, right? If you're to uh, give me a, a rank one approximation of a symmetric matrix, that rank one had better be symmetric, right? We, we want to in inherit the structure of the thing we're approximating. So it turns out the answer is yes. Uh, the U's and the D's are the same, and they're also symmetric. Uh, and I want to digress just for two minutes about something, since the high level, one of the high level things here is the connection between matrix and tensor computation. Let me show you this matrix. This would come from flattening uh, such a fourth order tensor with those three types of symmetry. And let's just visit this and, and see what's going on here. So I'm flattening it, and, and lo and behold, yeah, the flattened thing has symmetry. But let's look at it. Each block is symmetric, okay? It is also symmetric as a, as a block matrix. The, the one three block is the three one block, okay? Now those two things alone would imply that the matrix is symmetric, but there's one additional thing. Visit the same entry in each block. Okay. And that matrix is also symmetric. Okay. Now, um, it turns out, so like, in all my life in matrix computations, you know, lots of symmetry, but I'd never before seen this kind of symmetry. <laughs> right? And it turns out that the eigen system of this matrix is special. The eigenvectors are symmetric, meaning that if you get if you an eigenvector, it's length nine. If I reshape it into a three by three, it's symmetric. Okay. It's fairly easy to show. But here's the lesson, which is, that uh, I am surprised uh, in a very pleasant way about the new matrix problems that are coming up from the tensor business. So never in a, in a pure matrix setting would this probably arise. And yet in a very natural way, with the flattening of this very a common kind of symmetry in a fourth order tensor, we have a new matrix. Here's, so I've analyzed the, the eigenstructure of this and it's quite straightforward. Here's an interesting question. Suppose it's also positive definite. Okay? You would think that with this added level of symmetry, that maybe I can cut some corners. Maybe there's an abbreviated Cholesky factorization for such a matrix. Now in the quantum electronics uh, arena, they actually do a low rank approximation by ch uh, uh, Cholesky with column pivoting. Okay? Don't want to go into it, but uh, when I presented this to a bunch of chemists and so on, they were very interested in, gee, is there a way 
that our Cholesky method could inherit the rich structure of that tensor problem. You get it through the eigen vehicle, but Cholesky is much cheaper. So that's kind of an interesting research topic. And also a pointer that, again, very interesting matrix problems are coming up. Uh, in Orly's general, higher order generalized SVD, there is a, one of the coolest uh, summation matrix problems I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, uh, again, you, never see, you would never see this stuff unless you were working in this higher order venue. OK, um, I want to now get on to a, a, a topic that's also important in terms of blocking. Why do we block matrix computations? High performance, OK? Why might we block a, a tensor contraction? High performance. But question one, what is a tensor contraction? Here's an example. I've got an A and a B. It looks like they're a fourth order and a fifth order tensor. And I've chosen some indices, like two of them. This contraction is a two index contraction. And it, you'll agree that if after I do that summation, the answer is a function of the remaining indices. And thus, that defines a new tensor. It so happens to be a fifth order tensor. So I would call this a, uh, this is an example of a two index contraction. I chose the indices nicely so that I could show off multi index notation and show you how similar it is to matrix notation. Now i, j, and k are vectors of indices. The summation is, uh, 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 this is slang, the bold doesn't show up very well, but it's slang for that double summation. And you can see how um, much like matrix uh, uh, operations this is. OK, so tensor contractions are really disguised matrix products. What makes them interesting is their size, right? You can flatten, well, it might be a, sort of a modest size tensor, and you get a gigantic matrix, OK? So these are large scale matrix computations. Um, if you are to think of this in, uh, as a matrix multiplication, then you want this blocking property to, to um, this block unfolding property to hold. So uh, I want to skip over some of these. These are just more examples of tensor contractions. The, the key thing is you, you, you can get some very large tensors out of the small contractions. Okay? Um, there's a project called the Tensor Contraction Engine Project which was concerned with the evaluation of multiple sequences of contractions. And uh, as this example points to, you can get some gigantic intermediate tensors. Maybe you start out with some modest tensors. You can track them. Whoa, you get this giant intermediate thing. And then maybe it collapses at the end to something small. How do you go from here to there with limited memory? And they worked on that problem um, and made quite a bit of progress on it. Anyway, the tensor contraction thing. Um, as I mentioned in that earlier summation, it's, it really is a disguised matrix multiplication. Here's another um, tensor contraction. I guess it was in the previous slide. But written uh, in a way that stresses that a tensor contraction is really a bunch of matrix matrix multiplications. For example, um, uh, in, in that contraction, you end up having to compute 32 matrix matrix products. Um, Every matrix here is multiplied against every matrix there. Uh, research question. We um, know and are uh, always excited about like Strassen type algorithms that do matrix multiplication quicker than, than ONQ. Um, I can certainly apply Strassen to each of those 32 multiplications. But is there sort of a tensor level of Strassen? Can I do better than that? Uh, the data structure question. How are these things laid out? Okay. Um, a tensor contraction can be viewed as a matrix matrix product between flattened versions of those tensors. And thus, you know, flatten them in a block friendly way so you can pull off stuff like this in an uh, efficient way. Um, I want to just skip. So, uh, yeah, so let me just sort of sum up the, the contraction thing. And here's sort of the framework. Um, block unfold the two players, do an optimized matrix product, and reshape to get the tensor. Okay? And it's not just for high performance only. There's this thing about tensor level thinking. Uh, think of that slide where I had these different transitions from scalar level to scalar matrix level to block matrix to tensor. Um, the community has to learn how to think 
at the tensor level. You know, uh, you might look at a matrix problem, maybe it's written in AIJ language, and you can tell your colleague, hey, that's really a matrix matrix multiplication. Um, and you want to be able to look at an application area, spot a computation, say, hey, that is really a tensor contraction problem. And this sounds like a small thing, but again, uh, I think we in this field have a responsibility to help people reason and think and spot tensor computations. So a good notation uh, is very much a corollary of that, and it's by no means a minor corollary of that. Okay, last, uh, uh, it's getting a short change, but it's okay. Um, you know, blocking for performance, blocking for structure, uh, those are earlier themes. Here's one, blocking for insight. A little bit of history, again, cons consistent with let's bridge the gap from matrix to tensor computations. So um, there's a symmetric matrix. You gave me a rectangular matrix and I made it a symmetric matrix. And guess what? The eigensystem of that symmetric matrix is highly related to the SVD of A, okay? In particular, the top and bottom halves of the eigenvectors are singular vectors. Uh, the eigenvalues are plus minus singular values. So here's an interesting side note. Um, my colleague, Gene Gallo, you know, is sort of responsible for developing some of the uh, early methods for uh, uh, SVD computation. And the first concern was, take, how do I take my general matrix and reduce it to some compressed form. And he fed that into a symmetric tridiagonalizer. And so you take symbol of A and tridiagonalize it using similarity transformations. And he discovered uh, patterns in the tridiagonal entries. And from that, he went on to develop the bidiagonalization, which is the, um, um, what you do before you do the SVD algorithm. So again, blocking for insight, in other words, uh, um, you, hey, you have a hard problem, but let's embed it into something that's simpler, something that we know more about, and see if we can't squeeze out some new algorithms. That's the idea. Now, symmetry, uh, you saw an example before in the fourth order case, um, is very important, but there are many more options for symmetry among tensors. And uh, we need the notion of a transposition. So for example, uh, you have a third order tensor and I'm turning it into a different one, B. It's a transposition. Uh, I'm moving the indices around in that way. Right? So they're going to be de factorial, different possible transpositions. So when I think back to this picture, you know, hey, the matrix case is nice. There's only one way to transpose the thing. Now we've got a factorial number. And uh, here it is illustrated in the third order case. But is there an analog of this embedding? Is there a way of embedding a general tensor into one that I would call supersymmetric? You know, a supersymmetric tensor would have the property that no matter how I ordered those three indices, I get the same thing, okay? So that's sort of like a combined, uh, you know, it would have all these symmetries at once, okay? Um, and so there's the definition. And here is another Rubik's Cube <laughs> example. So you give me a general third order tensor, okay? And I, it can be rectangular, okay? And I am going to embed it into a three by three by three symmetric tensor. And here's how I do it. You know, I have 27 little blocks to play with. They're all gonna be zero except in these six slots. And in uh, block uh, IJK, I put the IJK transposition. So for example, this is the 3, 2, 1 block of the cube, and it's going to house the 3, 2, 1 transposition of A. And you can easily show that such a result is symmetric. Why is this of interest? Okay, Let's visit um, uh, some, tens some um, uh, notions of eigenvalues and singular values for tensors. So um, a reminder from the matrix case, um, the stationary values of that thing, if C is symmetric, are the eigenvalues of C. The stationary values of this thing, uh, when A is our general matrix, are the singular values of A. What's nice about these definitions is that they can be generalized to tensors. And this is a work uh, promoted by Lekhane Lim. And um, it's a way of generalizing uh, uh, the notion of an eigenvalue of a supersymmetric tensor. Uh, and a, yet another formulation of singular values for a general tensor. 
And those generalizations, the Rayleigh quotient generalizations, are pretty straightforward. Okay? Um, you're going to sum over you know, vectors u1, u2, and u3, and you do that summation upstairs, and you divide by the norm. There is a Rayleigh quotient for a general tensor. And you can talk about its stationary values, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and methods for finding them, so optimization methods. Hey, you might want to compute the gradient of that thing. Turns out it's quite straightforward. Uh, maybe it involves chronic or products. You see some of the modal on flattenings there. So gradient computation is pretty straightforward. So the point here is that um, uh, we can generalize these notions of eigenvalue and singularities to matrices through these Rayleigh quotients and, um, and formulate algorithms. So here's like a power method for optimizing um, one of those um, methods, and it's a sequence of matrix vector multiplications. You can show all kinds of things about it. But dual to this, because remember, any any general tensor can be embedded into a supersymmetric tensor. You then can discover new algorithms and relations between power methods for the singular values and power methods for the eigenvalues, just like in the matrix case. So this was kind of rushed, and I don't this isn't going to carry a lot of force or convince too much here. But uh, the, the idea here is again uh, the key behind all this work is to connect algorithms. All right. And it, was, it could be done through this symmetric embedding, okay? And that was a block tensor exercise. Okay. All right, um, let me wrap up here just from uh, to cover the high level things. I just said this, so um, that's an example of uh, how to look at disparate settings and spot commonalities, both in algorithms and in analysis, through blocking. Um, then uh, this Kronecker product SVD offers a new block level approach to, to low rank tensor approximation. And all the way back at the beginning, um, the importance of um, unfolding in a way that respects blocking. Because I'm absolutely convinced block tensor computations are going to become as important as block matrix uh, computations are uh, right now. OK, so there you go. I'm happy to answer some questions. So um, uh, is, is your question here, do we have to resort to unfoldings to discover things about tensors? Because tensors are mathematical objects in their own light. They have all kinds of operator theory, exactly. operator theoretic interpretation. So I've heard this thing, the discussion before. And uh, again, I think the field is hungry for uh, make, uh, making observations at that level. But they have to, in the end, you have to compute, right? Uh, and I'm unaware at, at this point of, en of uh, any uh, tensor computation that does not involve unfolding in some way or another. But I've heard this, I, you know, people say you unfold, you lose structure, okay? You know, you have your, your blue, green, and red matrix and you string them out, then suddenly you've lost something there, okay? Um, so um, I think people should keep looking for these things, but as I said, at this point, I am unaware of any uh, fruitful algorithmic stuff to come out of, hey, let's treat the tensor as the object it was intended to be. <laughs> in you know, it, so that's a nice, that's a good point, uh, but uh, again, it, it's an algorithmic challenge, I think, to exploit that point. Yeah? So, um, in mental learning, people do about matrices because if you code pairwise relations, mm -hmm. then you can Yeah. So yeah. do you have any general comments on if mental, you know, the theory of mastering mental learning start directly operating on tensors, what can we see and what do you think we can see? 
That's right. I mean, so like the slices of the, you know, certain modes in the tensor mean certain things. And as soon as we start through a general computation intermingling those, then the question is sort of like the, the previous question where we're destroying some underlying structure there. So, um, but again, um, the, but think about the matrix case, you know, the IJ entry means something and when we do an SVD, we intermingle that stuff, rows and columns get all scrambled up and yet we emerge from that with a meaningful interpretation of the data. So I would sort of argue that the same kind of thing can happen here. Now that, again, there might be better ways to unfold, more structure respecting ways. Now I've focused on the block business, but maybe some unfoldings are better than others from the standpoint of what those uh, variables mean, okay? Um, but again, uh, uh, it's similar to that for the first question, which it, it, it's, it's too bad we get sucked into this flattening um, business. Yeah. yeah. So, Charlie, for many of the matrix decompositions, one thing that helps us understand them, maybe even apply them or visualize them, are geometrical interpretations. Mm -hmm. so to what extent do, their, uh, do they exist for tensor decompositions? Is it an ongoing field? You mean if the underlying tensor has a strong geometric flavor to it somehow? Uh, or, or just say, so, so, so say when you're doing an SVD, it's like a rotation. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Or the GSVD, when you have when you rotate one matrix relative to another. Right, yeah. Is that... Is that um, I haven't, pretty much the literature, I'm uh, by no means uh, knowledgeable about all the literature, but most of the literature, it's all that's sort of algebraic, you know what I mean? I don't see any much thing driven from geometric concerns. Um, but again, under the general heading of structured tensor computations, uh, that certainly is something that hopefully would, would show up at some point. Yeah? The question about the structure of the tensor. So you don't have higher order statistics where you have cumulants and things like that, is it? No, I see SVD, if you recall, it was the U matrices that go on to figure in the decomposition. The V matrices don't matter, and that means it doesn't matter how I line up those columns in those flattened matrices. Okay? We reorder the columns would keep the same single values and keep the same U matrices. So there is flexibility that way. Yeah. All right. Oh, more question. All right. <laughs> Say that again?